What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi Shrinks and Sneakers. I'm a board certified psychiatrist making mental health content here on YouTube. And if you're new to the channel, I would love you to subscribe to the channel. It really helps me to know that this material is helpful. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for your support. So today we are going to talk about a topic that's been requested before, and it's called Everything You Need to Know About Trentilix or Vortioxetine. This is a newer type of antidepressant medication that people have asked me to cover in the past. So we're gonna go ahead and get right into this and I'm gonna tell you what you need to know about this medication. So as I've already alluded to for you guys here, Vortioxetine is sold under the brand name Trentilix or Brintilix and it's approved in the US for major depressive disorder only, although it's been used off-label for other indications and we will talk about them here. Now, interestingly enough, in the United States, the name was actually changed to Trentilix because in the US there's another medication that has a really similar name that's an antiplatelet medication used in cardiovascular disease called Brilanta. And so they didn't want people to get confused with the naming. It was also studied, like I said, for other indications, one of those being generalized anxiety disorder, mostly at lower doses, but the quality of evidence is poor and it does not appear to improve symptoms or quality of life in patients with GAD. Now, I wanna take a quick moment to make a point here before going into more details about the medication. When I say to you guys on one of these videos that the effect size is moderate, and when you look at the research on vortioxetine, it does not perform any better than other antidepressants, I'm not saying that in an individual case-by-case -case basis, it's not possible that one person may respond really well to this medication or even several people, right, in the population could respond to this medication better than other antidepressants. But when we're looking at the research literature as a whole, we're looking at, remember, large sample sizes, and we're saying in general, it does not perform as, it performs rather as well as other antidepressants, it doesn't perform any better. So I wanna kinda of make that point for you guys here. So it very well might be the case that an individual does better on this than somebody else, but it, on the whole, it is about the same. And based on all of the literature I reviewed to bring you this presentation, I do not believe this medication is effective for treatment-resistant depression, although people sometimes say that it is. The one place I do think this medication stands out a little bit, and again, this is sort of questionable too, is in cognitive enhancement or the enhancement of cognitive function. Now, I want to point out that we're not talking about cognitive enhancement in the sense of like taking amphetamines to improve your score on your test in college. We're talking here about cognitive dysfunction associated with depression. So for a patient that's depressed, their cognitive function is sometimes poor. Not everybody is that way, but they have poor concentration, poor ability to focus, poor ability to remember things, they just can't really seem to get the energy to try. So this medication actually does seem to improve cognitive dysfunction associated with depression. It also appears to improve cognitive function in geriatric depression. So that's a good thing for geriatric patients. And you might be saying to me, Dr. Rossi, well, what about dementia or neurocognitive disorders? Unfortunately, this medication failed to show any benefit in cognitive function for patients with, say, Alzheimer's disease. It has also been looked at in ADHD, but the trials failed to show any adequate benefit, and the drug company that manufactures vortioxetine decided to not go through with their plan to continue looking into approval for ADHD. So this medication falls into a class of medications that is now known as the serotonin modulators and stimulators. So this medication is considered a serotonin modulator and stimulator. And it's really thought to work by several different mechanisms. The first one is an oldie but a goodie, and that is serotonin reuptake inhibition. So we know that this is going to block the SIRT transporter and it's going to prevent the reuptake of serotonin, meaning more will be available in the synaptic cleft to bind to receptors. The next logical thing to be thinking about is, well, what receptors are we talking about here? So the other receptors that are modulated by this medication are 5-HT1A, and here it works as an agonist, and that may be why this there's a small, well, I shouldn't say that this is entirely true because people still get sexual dysfunction on this medication, but this may diminish the sexual side effects associated with this medication. So again, 5-HT1A agonism, 
of 5-HT1B partial agonist, and then there's a myriad of other ones. There's 5-HT1D and 5-HT3, and the 5-HT3 antagonism is thought to enhance neuroadrenergic as well as cholinergic activity, and there's some thought that this is what's responsible for the improved cognition and reduced nausea associated with trentilix. Now, 5-HT7 antagonism is also a procognitive and antidepressant, uh, an antidepressant um, receptor. So this blockade of 5-HT7 is going to also improve cognitive function and enhance the antidepressant effects of this medication. I do want to point out, and you can check out the link to my website where I will have a full chart on the targets for this medication, as well as the affinity for the receptors and what it does at each receptor. But the most robust action is actually on serotonin reuptake, no surprise there, right? It's an oldie but a goodie, and 5-HT3 antagonism. So the two most important mechanisms of action when we're talking about this medication is going to be blocking the CERT, um, blocking CERT and then also blocking 5-HT3 receptors. So there are other receptors at play here, like I talked about, but those are the two main one. Important things to know about the metabolism of Trantelix is it's actually metabolized by many of the cytochrome P450s, but the most important one, as usual with most antidepressants, is going to be cytochrome P450 2D6. 2D as in dog 6. It's also metabolized by 3A4 and 5, 2C19, 2C9, 2A6, 2C8, 2B6, and that's about it, but it's a lot. So the point is, whenever something is metabolized by multiple cytochrome P450s, inhibition or inhibition of one of them is not necessarily going to make that big of a difference, although the 2D6 does seem to be the main route of metabolism and the one that you have to watch out for with drug interactions. So the half-life of this medication is 66 hours, so obviously with a 66-hour half-life, you can dose this once a day. You don't have to take it more than once a day. And you may need to reduce the dose if a patient's taking a strong 2D6 inhibitor, say something like bupropion. Let's talk a little bit about the dosing. It's actually quite simple. Like I said, it's dosed once a day, and the doses are anywhere between 5 and 20 milligrams per day. The tablets come as either 5s, 10s, or 20 milligram tablets, and the initial dose for depression has been 10 milligrams per day, which can be increased as needed to a a target dose of 20 milligrams daily. Now for a generalized anxiety disorder, I said people looked at slightly lower doses, and in those cases they looked at 5 to 10 milligrams per day, not the 10 to 20 seen in depression. It can be taken with or without food, so there's no enhanced bioavailability or absorption with food. There's nothing that changes if you eat or don't eat when you take the medication. The other interesting thing about this medication is given its half-life, you can technically stop it without a taper, so that may or may not be something that you would want to do, but technically you could stop this without tapering it. So before starting this medication, there are no specific lab values that need to be done for healthy individuals. It might always be a good idea to get basic labs on anybody before you start one of these medications, but still there's no specific indication for a laboratory examination. The common side effects are the ones that are seen with many other antidepressant medications, and those include nausea, vomiting, constipation, sexual dysfunction, and possibly weight gain. Although this is unusual, it's still possible. The most common of the side effects, of course, was nausea, even though I said that that 5-HT3 antagonism or blockade could potentially help with nausea. It doesn't seem to alleviate all of the nausea from the clinical trials, so this is over 10%. The rest of the side effects I listed are reported in less than 10% of cases, but it is important to note that sexual dysfunction was seen not only in the treatment arm of these clinical trials, but also the placebo arm. So it was very interesting to see that there was a pretty high rate of sexual dysfunction in people who were taking a placebo when they did some of these clinical trials. Now, the rare life-threatening side effects to be aware of are seizure, induction of mania, or suicidal thoughts. Those are, again, there's always a black box warning about suicidal thoughts in patients under the age of 24 for all antidepressants. And the induction of mania, of course, taking an antidepressant without a mood stabilizer is like throwing gasoline on a dumpster fire. 
So you want to also avoid using this medication in a couple of cases. If someone is using the medication tramadol for pain, it can increase the risk of seizure and you're not going to want to combine this medication with an MAOI, so a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, because it can cause serotonin syndrome. As of right now, this medication is not recommended for patients who are or are trying to get pregnant. So I'm gonna wrap the video here. It's a bit of a long one, but there's some pieces I wanna just tie up. So while this medication may be helpful for some individuals, there's no evidence to support its use in treatment-resistant depression or other disorders outside of the primary indication for major depressive disorder. So I think it's important to note that this medication is really for patients with major depressive disorder, and if you're treatment-resistant, you're likely gonna to wanna to look elsewhere. There does seem to be a benefit for patients who have significant cognitive dysfunction because of their depression, and maybe that's where this medication really fits into the treatment algorithm for me, is if I have somebody with severe cognitive dysfunction that I believe is completely related to their depression, this may be a good choice of medication. The main side effect, of course, is nausea and sexual dysfunction, and this is common in all antidepressants. So to be honest, you really don't get a better side effect profile with these serotonin modulators. You must also con consider the cost here because this medication is going to be significantly higher cost than say a comparison medication like duloxetine, which actually outperformed vortioxetine in some of the clinical trials.